Hi everyone and welcome to our fourth webinar of the full semester. Today we have Dr. Christina Yevas um, giving us a presentation on the Caribbean, which we're very excited about. But before we start, we wanted to do a land acknowledgement. So we wanted to acknowledge that although we're meeting on a virtual platform today, we acknowledge the importance of the land that we each call home. So from coast to coast, we acknowledge the unceded and uh, sorry, the unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. So I'm going to pass over to Alec McClellan, who's going to be introducing our speaker for today. Hello, I have the great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Yovaz, who is an environmental archaeologist specializing in zoo archaeology and holds the position of assistant professor in the Department of Archaeology at Simon Fraser University. Her regional specialty is the Caribbean and has primarily worked in the Lesser Antilles, but also has experience working in Polynesia, France, and Canada. With her colleagues, she is currently collaborating with a heritage NGO in Curaçao, and they have recently been awarded a Community Engagement Initiative grant from SFU and Shirk funding for historical ecology project that will allow them to investigate long-term social environmental systems and biodiversity on Curaçao. The international and interdisciplinary team will be working with local communities, hopefully beginning the project in summer of 2021. She is an associate editor for both the Journal of Island and Coastal Archaeology and the Journal of Anthropological Research, as well as serving on the board of the International Association for Caribbean Archaeology. Thank you. Okay, so I think we still have Christina on mute. So let's try and take her off of mute. Okay, so I don't know if you can hear us, Christina, but it's still on mute. All right, uh, are you able to hear me? Perfect, yeah, great, there thank you. you. <laughs> a little bit of, it wouldn't be Zoom if there weren't a few technical. No, it wouldn't be, of course not. Get started off with, right? Thank you. All right, I, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and thank you, Alec, and thank you, Karen, and thank you to everyone for having me here today. I'm, I'm very glad to be able to speak to you. Um, as I'm on the SFU campus on Burnaby Mountain in BC, I'd like to begin myself by respectfully acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today um, from the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands of the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. So I am just going to go ahead and get, see if I can get this started. Oh. Um, it looks like my slides are frozen, so I'm just going to try rebooting um, the screen share. Oh, all right, I think we're good to go here. So as Alec mentioned, uh, my work focuses on issues of biodiversity and human environment interaction. Um, for the last several years, I've been documenting the introduction of non-native animals to the Caribbean islands uh, by indigenous peoples in the 2000 years prior to European contact. So a process that we call translocation, the movement of animals um, from one place to another. I've been looking at the timing of these events, the social processes driving their spread and the impacts to island ecosystems. Now, as many of you um, can appreciate, I'm sure, uh, the Caribbean is small. It's less than 0.2% of the Earth's land surface. 
And unless you work in Latin America, you've probably never heard of many of the animals that you're looking at uh, right now on the screen. But these are some of the animals I've been investigating. Um, because of this, it's really easy to dismiss these regional introductions as a parochial concern. So before I dive into this talk, I want to provide some context for why we should care about how and why uh, people were moving animals across space hundreds and even thousands of years ago. This is a bit of a grab sample of animal introductions from around the globe. Uh, beginning with the earliest known instance of uh, translocation uh, involving the couscous, which is this little guy you see down here. Uh, it's a type of possum, and it was uh, translocated to the island of New Ireland, either from New Guinea or uh, New Britain, at least 20,000 years ago. The collection of animals that you see here on the screen show up suddenly in the archaeological record without any paleontological evidence for their prior presence. And because they can't swim or fly significant distances, human involvement is implicated in their overwater dispersal. The animals seen here are believed to have been introduced intentionally. Looking at this map, uh, what's surprising is how early in time animal introductions are seen on a global scale. Animal translocation is in fact something that's been part of the human behavioral repertoire for 20,000 years. So it's a phenomenon that's older than domestication and spatially more extensive than domestication. But it hasn't received the same degree of theoretical or methodological treatment that domestication has. And this is so even though uh, translocation like domestication entails fundamental shifts in the way humans perceive their relationship with animals. A second important consideration that I want to touch on involves the ecological legacy of these introductions. Now, today we recognize um, exotic species as a threat. They disrupt local ecology, they displace native species, they reduce ecosystem resilience, um, ultimately leading to extinctions and reduced biodiversity and also entailing a 1.4 trillion US dollar price tag uh, annually uh, for economic losses that uh, arise as a consequence. But in most instances of prehistoric introduction, we have very little understanding of how exotic species impacted environments uh, or how the severity of modern introductions might have been conditioned by these earlier events. So those concerns, those are ones of priority effects and historical contingency are important. Priority effects refers to the introduction order of species um, that can shape the trajectory of environmental consequences. So, for example, when one introduced species occupies a niche that excludes a later invader or keeps another in check through predation. The effect of species introductions on biodiversity depends on this dynamic interplay um, of cultural and environmental variables then. So, in other words, historical circumstances matter. To illustrate this, um, I want to briefly turn to two cases of camel introduction in the mid 1800s uh, to Canada, so right here, uh, where it was introduced to central uh, British Columbia as a pack animal uh, during the caribou gold rush and then to Western and Central Australia, where it was used for exploration and hauling cargo. So if you're looking carefully, you'll notice two humps for BC, one hump for Australia. In both places, camels escaped or were released into the wild. In Australia, in 2010, the estimated camel population was over 1 million animals. And today, Australians regularly cull these herds to uh, control the serious environmental infrastructure damage that camels cause. In BC, we don't have a camel problem. Uh, camels didn't survive beyond that first generation. So the difference between these two cases comes down to in part the biology of, of these animals, but also the idiosyncrasies of the particular case. Uh, 
Uh, in the instance of BC, the founding population was small. The camels came into conflict with humans uh, and livestock, particularly horses. And so they were quickly rejected by people. And then once they were out in the wild, they were vulnerable to large predators. And these are circumstances which didn't prevail in Australia. So what this case nicely illustrates is that not all introduced species become established. And of those species that do become established, not all become bioinvasive. Essentially what that means is that we can't make assumptions about what the impacts of long past species introductions were. We actually need to investigate these. So that's a very long wind up to my talk, um, but you'll see that we return to some of these uh, themes later on. The story I'd like to focus on begins with this map. This was published in 1657 in a volume called A True and Exact History of the Island of Barbados. And it was written by an Englishman named Richard Wigan. The map is actually thought to be based on an earlier version that's now lost. And so it actually provides a depiction of Barbados uh, within just a few years of English settlement of the island in 1627. The Ligon map, I should add, is um, quite well known in colonial Caribbean or West Indian uh, history and has an almost iconic status. The image is actually rotated counterclockwise. So here's Barbados in context. You can see um, it's this little fly specked island um, just over on the eastern periphery of uh, the chain of islands known as the Lesser Antilles that runs um, from north to south here. And so most of these, uh, these islands are volcanic. Uh, Barbados stands apart from uh, most of the Lesser Antilles in that it's uh, composed geologically of marine carbonate uh, rocks that are uh, quaternary and tertiary in age. So essentially it's marine limestone that represents ancient uplifting coral reefs. Now, the English were not the first to arrive to Barbados. Indigenous people were there uh, at least 4,000 years ago. A second group of indigenous settlers arrived 1,800 years, years ago during a period known as the Ceramic Age. And then it appears from the archaeological record that sometime just before or around European arrival, the island is depopulated. So those indigenous people leave. When the Spanish and Portuguese arrive in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, they note that there's nobody there. Um, and they themselves don't establish any settlements. They stay just long enough to make some cartographic observations and deposit uh, some pigs on the island. In 1625, the first English ship arrives. And then two years later in 1627, uh, the first permanent uh, settlers arrive, English settlers, and they establish a colony on the island. Richard Ligon comes to Barbados 20 years after that in 1647. And he stays only for a few years, just under three years. And then he goes back to England. So who is Richard Ligon and why is he important? Well, he was a member of the English gentry, but he was, as he described himself, the fourth son of a third son. And so he inherited a respectable name, but a diluted fortune. In his efforts to make a living, unfortunately, he became involved in a land speculation scheme that went sideways. And at this time, the English Civil War was on and Ligon was a royalist. So he found himself very suddenly on the wrong side of the conflict. His land was confiscated by a group of parliamentarian roundheads and he wound up destitute uh, and in debt with few people willing to help him because his name was now tarnished uh, and uh, his political leanings went the wrong way. So to escape his creditors and uh, potentially improve his prospects, he made for the West Indies at, in 1647 at the very vigorous young age of 60. Uh, and his original plan in fact was actually to go to the island of Antigua, which is up in the Northern part of the Lesser Antilles, but 
it didn't pan out the way he hoped. Uh, and he ended up in Barbados instead. And he stayed there for about three years. Um, had what we could probably describe as mixed success, and then uh, returned to England in 1650 and was very soon afterward thrown into prison. So possibly as a scheme to pay off his creditors, he wrote this account of his time in Barbados. And it's a good thing that he did because the volume is incredibly important. It provides a first hand account of a fledgling colony at this historically significant moment in time. When Ligon arrived, sugarcane had just recently been introduced to the island and the sugar industry was just starting to ramp up. Planters had experimented with improved extraction and refining processes and discovered how to produce white sugar. So that's sugar with all the molasses removed. It's what we go to the store now and pay just a few dollars uh, for a kilogram. Form. So at the time, this was incredibly prized and valuable. And because of this development, land on the island is increasingly given over to sugar production. Now, sugar production is incredibly labor intensive. And to the meet the growing labor demand, the British increasingly turn to enslaved African labor. To give you some idea of the scale of this transformation, in 1645, before, the sugar, before sugar production becomes widely established on Barbados, the island had just under 5,700 slaves. 53 years later, it had more than 42,000. Barbados develops one of the largest sugar industries in the world and becomes a powerhouse in the Atlantic triangular trade. But this is all just starting when Ligon arrives. So his volume uh, provides critical historical insight into how sugar, slavery, and British capitalism all come together as part of this same process of social and economic transformation. It's also really important from a biogeographic perspective. It documents the island's natural history and biodiversity and provides a detailed inventory of Eurasian animal introductions. All of this biogeographic and historical information is distilled into this map that accompanies the text. Here you can see signs of the emerging economy and plantation systems. So if you look carefully, you can see ships arriving to the island. You can see land holdings marked out on the map. So here they are, over here. Uh, here in the upper portion of map, there's a scene of men on horseback pursuing a runaway uh, slave. And this captures the growing role of slavery on Barbados. There are a few seemingly whimsical elements like this indigenous figure on the right uh, wearing a crown. But a close reading of Ligon's text shows that for the most part, he's illustrating things that he experienced or that he heard settlers talking about on the island. So for example, the indigenous figure is in fact an allusion to an incident in which about 40 Arawak peoples were lured from Guyana on the South American mainland uh, to Barbados under false pretenses and then enslaved once they reached the island. The map also catalogs the introduction of a number of Eurasian animals, mostly domestic livestock. And hopefully by now you've noticed the camels among that cohort. Here's one right here. Um, camels were a real introduction to the island and according to Ligon, in any case, uh, they died off um, within about uh, two decades because people didn't really know how to care for them. So another failed to introduction. But elsewhere we see typical barnyard animals. So cattle, sheep, horses, donkeys, and so forth. The map also has three scenes involving pigs. Ligon recounts how he was told by settlers that pigs were roaming free in great abundance when they arrived to the island in 1627. 
And it's now become conventional wisdom that the Portuguese or the Spanish introduced pigs to Barbados on a passing voyage at some point in the 1500s in the 16th century. Ligon actually spent a lot of time in the volume um, talking about pigs. I think he mentions them in 10 different places. He seems to be hyper concerned with them for, for reasons that aren't quite clear. He gives recipes on how to cook them. He talks about how to hunt and husband them. Um, and so a lot of juicy historical details about pigs in this book. And this is where my research comes in. Uh, several years ago, I was at the Barbados Museum and Historical Society uh, on Barbados uh, to examine archaeological uh, collections for prehistorically introduced species. And I encountered this skeletal specimen that you see here. This is from the Chancery Lane site. It's a fragment of a right mandible, so the, the lower jaw. Uh, most of the teeth are missing, so there should in fact be some incisors right here, and there would also be a first premolar that would sit here, but because um, the specimen is broken, that's fallen out. Um, you can also see this very strong, large projecting canine. And it looks a lot like a pig mandible, a pig jawbone. And so what? Uh, a pig would not be a remarkable find. The bone was actually in a bag with other bones that included historically introduced animals. And we know from these historic records that the English arrived and they found lots of pigs on Barbados. Uh, and these were left behind you know, by the Spanish or Portuguese. So this really isn't a very surprising find. I didn't make much of it at the time. I didn't look at it closely until much later uh, went back in the lab. And there are a couple of things to take note of here. The first of these is the morphology of the diastema. And that is uh, this gap that you see um, between where the first premolar would sit and where the canine would sit. And this is uh, medially concave, meaning it dips inward in this um, sort of bird's eye view here, looking uh, down from the top onto the mandible. You can see that it. Um, uh, uh, kind of pockets inward and that there's a very strong border here, not interrupted by any teeth. And the other thing to take note of is uh, the canine itself, which projects um, quite directly upward rather than out and to the side. And so these osteologically, these are very diagnostic traits, but not for pig. Um, instead, for this animal, a peccary. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with a peccary, but for those of you who are not, it's a New World mammal. They're native to the continental Americas and also to Trinidad, but they don't occur naturally on any other Caribbean islands. When we compare peccaries to wild pigs, uh, wild domestic pigs or feral pigs, so that is um, domesticated pigs that have sort of gone back to the wild, um, and subsequently have taken on a wild form in which they're very, very hairy um, and quite mean. Um, you can see that they look a lot alike. Uh, domestic pigs, however, are native to Eurasia. They were only introduced to the Americas with the arrival of Europeans. So although peccaries and pigs, wild pigs, look superficially very similar, they branched off from each other 40 million years ago and they're classed in different, in different families. So they're actually quite different. <clears throat> For comparison, here's the mandible, uh, the lower jawbone of a pig and the skull of the pig um, for uh, next to the peccary specimen uh, that we're, we've been looking at here. And one of the things that should obviously stick out to you is the uh, the, um, the shape and morphology and direction of this large canine tooth. So in the pig, this um, juts outward and eventually will start to curl back as it continues to grow. Um, in peccaries, the canine projects directly upward and it doesn't grow for life. It, uh, it has determinate growth. We also have a small um, premolar sitting right here um, in between that gap uh, of the um, first uh, or of the canine and the rest of the tooth row. Now there are three existing peccary species. Unfortunately, our um, 
Barbados specimen isn't complete enough to assign to any of these, but it likely belongs to one of two candidates, which are fairly widespread uh, throughout North, Central, and South America. The first of these is the white-lipped peccary with the distribution that you see here. And the other is the collared peccary uh, with a similar overlapping, somewhat overlapping distribution, uh, but it also extends up into the southern United States. So why is this interesting? Well, first, peccary doesn't occur on Barbados. It's not present today. There are no historic records for its introduction. There are no archaeological or paleontological records for its presence on Barbados. Second, the specimen provenience is almost a complete mystery. The only available information is what you see written on this bag up here. This is how I found it. Um, Chancery Lane is the collection site. Connell is given as the name is the, of the excavator. There's another name, Shillstone, on the bag. Uh, but there are no field notes for this excavation with the museum. What we do know uh, is that Eustace Shillstone was the founder of the Barbados uh, Museum and director, uh, and Neville Connell was his successor. Both of these individuals conducted archaeological excavation at Chancery Lane um, in the 30s through the 60s, along with others. The peccary mandible was likely recovered in the course of these activities. Uh, but there's no context information. Um, Chancery Lane is a multi-component site. It has a pre-contact occupation that spans about 260 AD to 660, uh, as well as a more recent historic occupation. Looking at the mandible, it's in pretty good shape overall. Uh, it looks pretty recent. Uh, that combined with the fact that there was a tooth from a horse or donkey in the same bag suggests that this specimen um, came from either very shallow archaeological deposits or from the surface of the site. Uh, so it's probably more recent in time, but uh, given the absence of any excavation records or additional records, we can't take anything about the specimen's provenience for granted. So we can't even be sure it's archaeological or that it even originates from Barbados if it is a surface find. So to resolve some of these issues, colleagues at the University of Florida and I decided to conduct strontium isotope analysis on the specimen in conjunction with work we were doing to characterize the strontium isotope for the region. For those of you who might not be familiar, analysis of strontium isotopes in skeletal tissues is used to detect human and animal mobility. Uh, tooth enamel is the preferred sample type. Strontium is available in the environment to be taken up by living organisms, living plants and animals, uh, with different regions exhibiting different uh, ratios of strontium 86 to strontium, or strontium 87 to strontium 86 based on various geologic, atmospheric, and hydrospheric inputs. When the strontium relate, uh, ratio of an organism departs from the range of biologically available strontium ratios in the environment in which it's found or recovered archeologically, we know that it's not local to that environment. So we analyzed about a dozen samples from Barbados to characterize the bioavailable strontium for the island. And as expected, we found that this closely reflected the strontium ratio of seawater, um, which is what we would anticipate for an island that's geologically composed of ancient coral reefs. So here you can see the distribution of sample locations from around the island in relation to uh, the geology. So Chancery Lane is right down here. And most of the island is composed of this uh, uh, coral rock, about 85% of this coral rock. And then there's uh, an area here which differs slightly, um, is slightly older and differs somewhat in its uh, geology. And here are the results in table format, which I don't expect you to read. So here they are plotted out. 
And um, you can see here graphically the range of ratios for Barbados samples of, of known local origin. And we do have um, one uh, sample that plots relatively low. This isn't an outlier. This actually comes from that region in green that we saw um, uh, in the map uh, just prior, uh, which has, is characterized by a slightly different geology than the rest of the island. Uh, but in general, we have this range here uh, of local samples and the peccary uh, with a ratio of 0 0.70890 falls right within that range and is consistent with these local samples, meaning that this animal is probably from Barbados. Now we can't rule out with 100% certainty an origin from somewhere else with similar bioavailable strontium ratios as Barbados. So I want to briefly look at that potential um, uh, possibility. This map shows average bioavailable strontium for the Caribbean uh, and for surrounding uh, the surrounding continent. The closest island with an average strontium ratio similar to Barbados is the Carbonate Island of Marie Gallant, about 330 kilometers to the north. And the thing about Marie Gallant is uh, that uh, peccary here is unknown either historically or prehistorically. So that makes it an unlikely source for uh, the Barbados specimen. There is one other island to consider, and that's Trinidad, 290 kilometers away. Now, ratios for Trinidad um, overall tend to be um, above 0.71, but there are parts of the island with uh, strontium signals that are similar to Barbados, and that's this yellow band that you can see here in a little pocket there, tiny little pocket in here. Notably, Trinidad is the only island where peccaries occur naturally, uh, and that's, uh, they're native to the island, and that's because um, Trinidad was once connected to South America up, and, up until the end of the last ice age. Now, peccaries tend to have fairly large ranges, so their isotope ratios are not, are, they're likely to reflect a mixing of ratios from different environments rather than a localized area in the south of Trinidad. This is corroborated by human and peccary samples from a separate study on Trinidad uh, that uh, exhibit significantly higher ratios than what we see in the Barbados specimen. So taking that into consideration, my colleagues and I believe that it's most likely that the Barbados specimen represents an animal that was living on Barbados and interacting with that environment. But when exactly did it roam the Barbados landscape? In order to gain some clarity, we decided to radiocarbon date the specimen. We got an AMS date that came back with um, uh, an age of 235 years before pre present, plus or minus 15 years. And the calibrator range for that is 80, 1645 to 1670, or 1780 to 1800, with a median probability of 80, 1660. Uh, now, the two calibrated uh, radiocarbon ranges arise from the fact that we have multiple intercepts of the calibration curve for the measured age. So uh, combining those or coalescing those together, these dates place the, uh, the peccary specimen within the first 175 years of English settlement with a greater probability associated with that earlier date range 1645 to 1670, which would make it roughly coeval with the time of Ligon's visit to Barbados. So we know we have a local animal from the 16th or from the 17th or 18th century, but this now leads to some even bigger questions. Was this the only peccary on the island? How did it get to Barbados? And why is there no written record for this introduction? 
Um, at this point, I hope that you're seriously um, also beginning to question the relationship of this pickery to uh, Barbados's colonial pig population. So, uh, I would like to first look at this um, first question here. Um, was this uh, a lone peccary? Harkening back to the beginning of this talk, the number of peccaries on Barbados is relevant to the magnitude of their possible ecological impact. Now on the most conservative side, the peccary in question may have been uh, introduced at a very young age, young enough for its teeth to develop on the island and acquire a loan signal or a local signal. So the bone might actually represent um, a single isolated event, a failed introduction of one animal, maybe a po possibly a few animals. At the other end of the spectrum, the peccary may have been one among a number of peccaries on Barbados, possibly born to an established herd that was living on the island and reproducing um, on the island. Now, to my mind, statistically, the odds of finding the skeletal remains of a single introduced animal from 350 years ago are pretty small. So the explanations that I'm going to look at for how peccary arrived to the island are based on the working assumption that we have more than one animal present. So how did peccary get to Barbados? We essentially here have um, three uh, possible um, culprits, if you will. Um, the first could have been uh, uh, involved pre-contact indigenous uh, Caribbeans who introduced uh, the peccary. Um, it may have been Spanish or uh, Portuguese sailors active in the 16th century, or it might represent an introduction by the English themselves following colonization of further settlement of the island in uh, 1627. Now, Ligon uh, in his volume talks about uh, how indigenous peoples in the early colonial period uh, uh, came, parties, hunting parties came from the Northern Lesser Antilles uh, to hunt the pigs on the island. Um, in reading those stories, there are some reasons to be a little bit suspicious about them. There's some reasons to question them, um, regardless of whether these are true or not. Um, it's certainly possible that indigenous peoples may have introduced peccaries, not pigs, to, to Barbados uh, in the pre-contact period. Animal translocations are a widespread uh, phenomenon for the prehistoric West Indies. And peccary remains are found um, in a number of places throughout uh, the Caribbean in the pre-contact period. So here you can see peccary remains uh, marked out by these yellow diamonds and they have a fairly widespread distribution. It's important to note here, however, that many of these uh, specimens, many of these records involve worked bone, things like drilled teeth uh, and artifacts, uh, uh, ornaments that might have been used for personal adornment. So it might actually be the objects themselves, not live animals that are being introduced. Regardless, there's a larger question here. Um, there are no pre-contact archeological records for the presence of peccary on Barbados. So we really need to question um, if people, uh, if indigenous peoples introduced peccary to Barbados and those animals lived on the island long enough to be recorded by the English when they arrived, why aren't we seeing them in the archeological record? So taking this all together, it seems rather unlikely that we have a free contact indigenous introduction here. Alternatively, uh, the introduction may have been brought about by the Spanish or the Portuguese. Uh, it was common practice during the age of exploration for sailors to drop off a pair of pigs or goats to an island when stopping to replenish supplies so that on future uh, return voyages, they would have a source of fresh meat. Uh, 
Now, we know that um, the Spanish and Portuguese had arrived to Barbados at some uh, different points in the 16th century. And both the Spanish and Portuguese did have an established presence uh, uh, in the region on Trinidad and uh, along the northeastern border of South America in the Guianas. So it's possible that they introduced peccary um, on an outbound voyage from the New World, uh, dropping these animals off on Barbados um, and allowing them to flourish there. And there is some anecdotal evidence to support this. Uh, there is some speculation from an, a 19th century explorer in, uh, uh, about uh, the possibility that the peccary that were introduced uh, to this island may not have been uh, domestic European pigs, but instead um, uh, what he called uh, the native breed, a reference to peccary. And we also have some ancillary evidence from other sources. This is the uh, Hansius map of the Guianas. It was drawn up in the 15, 1590s based on uh, European observations of the regions uh, and made by a uh, Flemish map maker, Jodicus Hansius in uh, 1597. And it documents economic and territorial interests in the region. There's some fanciful flourishes here. You can see uh, this headless individual with his face firmly planted in his chest. But uh, you'll also notice that there is an inventory of native wildlife on this map meant to document the abundance of the new world. And among these animals is this guy. Uh, this is a peccary. And it's accompanied by this uh, Dutch inscription here, which basically says, that all of these animals you can find in Guiana and they're really good to eat. So here in this map, we have evidence for an awareness of uh, a native variety of, of pig, if you will, uh, along with um, the possibility uh, for uh, them to have been exploited for food. So we have, in this explanation, we see the, um, uh, uh, an established presence by the, the Spanish and the Portuguese, which would have uh, created an opportunity for them to be able to translocate these animals, an awareness that these uh, peccaries are good as a game, a game item or, or prey item, and uh, the timing also comes together quite nicely. There is one last uh, possibility that I'd like to look at here. In his volume, Ligon laments quite frequently, actually, uh, about the lack of game that's available on Barbados. And this is actually a widespread phenomenon throughout the, the Caribbean islands. They're generally depopulated of large mammalian fauna. So it's possible that the English themselves introduced uh, peccaries to the island to serve as a source of wild game. Uh, we know the English introduced uh, fallow deer and white-tailed deer to other islands, and so it might be the case that they chose to introduce peccary um, for hunting to Barbados. That might have occurred before Ligon's arrival, it could have occurred after, um, but probably would have occurred in addition to the introduction of domestic pigs. Looking at all of these possible explanations and taking the evidence as a whole um, on the balance, I think a 16th century introduction by the Portuguese or the Spanish is the most likely explanation. This is, doesn't preclude pigs being introduced um, during the colonial era, but it seems most likely that um, having the opportunity um, and, and the established presence in the region, the Spanish or the Portuguese dropped these pigs off some point in the 16th century. The, swan, uh, the herds multiplied uh, and that accounts for these descriptions that we see uh, in, uh, in English accounts of these swine-like animals that have almost overrun the island upon uh, English arrival. <clears throat> We do have this one last big question though. Uh, 
why are these, uh, why is this introduction not recorded anywhere? Why is there no textual record? Well, peccaries and pigs were regularly confused up until the early, up until the 19th century. Uh, and in fact, they're readily confused today. So what we're looking at here is an illustration from Texas Parks and Wildlife. It's part of the material that they put out to educate hunters to be able to tell the difference between peccaries and feral pigs in Texas, because there's a hunting season for both of these. And in order for hunters to be in compliance, they need to be able to distinguish these animals. And they are, again, so physically similar. So it's possible that the English simply didn't register a conceptual or a linguistic distinction between peccaries and pigs. Ligon uses the term, various terms for pigs in his volume in a very generic way. And it's, uh, it may be the case that um, although they saw physical differences between these animals, they didn't necessarily interpret those differences to mean that they were two different uh, species. It is the case, however, that there may actually be a record for uh, pet reintroduction to Barbados. Now, I'm not a big advocate of reading too much into, um, into artistic renderings. I think we need to be very cautious with that sort of thing and certainly um, be hesitant to make species attributions. But it's very interesting to note that in this map, uh, pigs essentially take two forms. The first is this smooth form that you see over here on the right, which is very reminiscent of a classic um, uh, unhairy uh, captive domestic pig. And the second is this hairy form, which looks a lot like a peccary. I think Ligon, unbeknownst to him, was actually illustrating peccaries in his map. And so in this, um, in this record, we have uh, preserved the account or evidence for the introduction of a previously unrecognized animal to Barbados. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all of these individuals and institutions that you see listed here. And I'm happy to take any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christina, for that really fascinating talk. Um, so we do have a, a member with us here on Zoom. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is still muted, but um, if anyone on Zoom um, would like to ask a question, you can definitely unmute yourself and do that right now. We also have a couple of people watching on Facebook. We're a little bit delayed with the time on Facebook. Sure. It's a little bit behind. So I'll give them a little bit of time to, uh, to catch up. And again, if anyone wants to ask any questions, please feel free to do so. And we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Um, I actually, I had one to get us started. Have sure. you ever had to combine zoarchological analysis with historical data like this ever before. It seems like there's such a, a reliance on the historic data, which is fascinating in and of itself. And I wondered if, is this a unique case that you've had to deal with or is, has this been fairly common with your research in the Caribbean? For me, um, this was, in, in terms of the extent that I had to go into uh, historical documents and the historical literature, this was actually new for me. I'm, I'm for the most part, firmly, entrenched in the pre-contact period. So this was both um, fascinating in some ways and revelatory in terms of the amount of um, very fine, high resolution information that I could get from something like reading um, re letters that were written a couple of hundred, you know, three, 400 years ago. That was fascinating. And, and to be able to kind of climb into the mindset of the individual writing um, that account was, um, was amazing. Um, I, I, I still work in the pre-contact period, but this was definitely a, a really interesting foray or, you know, kind of garden path around what I normally do. Awesome. Yeah, it certainly seems 
a really interesting <laughs> kind of side path to have taken for sure. This was really unexpected. Um, I, uh, you know, it was one of those things where my colleagues and I just followed our nose because we were more curious than anything else about how this wound up on the island. Yeah, and, and what a kind of story to be able to tell this amount from that one bag that you found. <laughs> it's yeah. quite extraordinary. Awesome. Um, does anyone else on Zoom have any questions for our speaker? I know it's, most people are on mute, but I think you can unmute yourselves. Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Perfect. I have a question. Um, do you have any plans to go back to the where the bone was found and excavate any further to look for more examples of pickery? Yeah, so the site's not there anymore. Yeah. So um, that possibility doesn't really exist. Unfortunately, um, that is the case for um, good chunks of Barbados. The coastal development has been really pronounced. So a lot of sites that were excavated, you know, in the last century just aren't aren't really available for that anymore. Um, so we really have to turn to these um, these uh, uh, museum collections, these legacy collections, to kind of explore these questions. I do have some colleagues who've told me that. Um, who work in, in on Barbados in the historic period who now tell me that they're going to be looking at their pig bones a lot more closely um, and we'll see if anything comes out of that. Okay yeah that was my follow-up question is everyone looking over at all of their assemblages to see if they have pickery in it? <laughs> yeah so it, and again it's going to depend on things like you know what part of the skeleton you have and how fragmented that's that pieces but certainly things like zoom and adna might be able to help identify those specimens that um, if they're there may have been overlooked okay thanks and then we had another question uh, from diana and she asks um are you planning to carry out any other isotope analyses on the specimen like lead or carbon and nitrogen uh, in fact, we did do all of those things. Oh. Um, so the lead, uh, unfortunately, lead doesn't really work in the Caribbean for um, some very complicated reasons that um, that I won't go into. Um, but my colleagues have and and have ex and I have explored at a great length. Um, basically, it's an issue of contamination from from the environment with modern lead. Um, so lead's not terribly reliable. We did do oxygen isotopes on this specimen uh, in the Caribbean for the most part. There's just not enough variation for the region to be able for oxygen isotopes to be useful in the way that strontium is. And I think for the carbon, uh, it, it just came back indicating it was a terrestrial um, C3 diet, which is kind of what you would expect. So. Perfect. And then we have another question for you um, from, I, I think you pronounced this uh, Aleska, so apologies if I've pronounced your name wrong. Um, and they say, uh, thank you, Dr. Yivas. This was a great talk. I'm curious how you and your team may incorporate ZooMS or proteomics into this research. So uh, thanks for that question, Alexis. So Zoom's, Zoom's analysis and proteomics. Um, we, we haven't pursued that. That would be certainly uh, a great thing to do if we actually wanted to refine the, the species designation. So right now, we only know that um, it's a peccary. Uh, we might be able to get genus level information if we did Zoom's analysis on this. Um, you know, Zooms usually has a resolution to family or sometimes down to genus level, uh, depending on the taxonomic group. So that isn't something we've kind of pursued. Um, it might further delineate where the animal actually came from because the, the colored peccary and the white lip peccary have slightly different ranges, but they do overlap in some regions. Uh, it's not something that's currently on our radar, or those certainly would be interesting project. Perfect. So I think that's it for the questions. We don't have anyone else. Oh, and they say thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> so yeah, if no one else has any questions, I think that will conclude. I just have a oh, curiosity. Well, uh, do you know if uh, peccaries and pigs uh, can 
create hybrids or if you can get a hybrid between the two species i'm completely ignorant on this I'm, but, I'm not that i've ever heard from they're quite um the, i mean like i said they're separated by 40 million years of evolution so although they look quite alike you know we're talking about you know the difference between like a horse and a cow right yeah um they do co-occur in a number of places and where that happens they basically engage in niche partitioning meaning they use strategies to separate themselves so if they're fighting over food they'll forage at different times of the day so they don't compete um and, and so it's yeah no no interbreeding that i've ever heard of in any case thank you Perfect. Well, thank you so much again, Christina, for, for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's been fascinating learning all about your research. Uh, thanks thank you so to much. everyone that was um, watching on Facebook. And thanks to those of you that joined us on Zoom as well. And uh, we hope to see you again at our next webinar, final webinar for the series, which will be with Dr. Justin Jennings in December. Thanks again. Bye, everyone.